is dead. So not only is that wrong in principle, but uh, also it's completely unrealistic. Because what I think is missing from Adam's analysis of the elite is how is it going to be policed? The assumption is that the trade unions will simply agree to a pact and then go to their members and say, right, this is what you've got to do. If we've learned anything from the last few years, it's surely that that is totally impossible. <coughs> unions are their members. They can't just sit around a table with the business and government and agree to things which are not in the interest of those members and then be expected to uh, be, be the policeman. And the workers will simply reject them. And this is not just a theoretical thing, as we well know. It's actually happening at the moment. So I think, um, finally, going back to history, I think actually the Weimar Republic analogy is a very good one. But the assumption is that uh, if we're in a Weimar situation, that inevitably leads to a victory of counter-revolution. It did in that case, of course, but it isn't inevitable. But the, uh, the revolutionary situation which existed then is very similar to what's happening now, and uh, we can still uh, turn it to our advantage, provided we learn the lessons of uh, Weimar, and obviously there isn't time for me to go into all of that. Great, okay. Um, uh, uh, it's an interesting question. Uh, are we uh, Russia in 1905? Are we the Weimar Republic? <laughs> are we Europe after the Second World War? Are we Southern Europe? I mean, are we Latin America? Well, are we South Africa? Yes. And what might that mean? I wonder. Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Carl. I feel rather set up there. I was, I was about to talk about the revolutionary process in Germany from 1919 to 1923, but I'll, I'll, I'll drop that now. Give it a miss. Yeah. Um, the conditions for the pact and the characterization of the maritime moment. I'm Gavin, and I'm at Swap, like Jackie and like Cole, but this wasn't a predetermined uh, contribution, though it may sound like it was. Um, just on the, just on, on, on the pact, the, the moment of 2008, representing the hope, really, I, I think was the way that you were putting it, a strengthening of labour relative to capital and the possibility of new forms of uh, social delivery coming out of that. And um, two problems with that. Number one, you mentioned the new growth, growth path which is probably the more left version of the MDP, let's say. But even within the new growth path, the basic fun or one of the basic fundamental problems remains in the economy, adding on to Jane, which is the whole question of the financialization of the South African economy and mass capital flight is not addressed at all. So all the wealth which is being generated in South Africa is shooting straight out of South Africa onto the London Stock Exchange, onto the New York Stock Exchange, and disappearing. And there is no attempt to address that whatsoever. And indeed, the Ministry of Finance, which was and remains the ideological and organisational centre of neoliberalism within South Africa, still absolutely calls the shots within government and government policy. So in fact, there is no attempt whatsoever to discipline capital, but rather to reproduce the conditions whereby capital can discipline the state, which it is doing very successfully. So if that's the finest fruit of the 2008 moment, we have trouble just in terms of your own strategy. Then leading on to the characterization of the Marikana moment, I think one of the lessons to draw from the Marikana moment is precisely the problem of pacting. Because if there was any trade union which ever took the notion of the social contract into account in its policy, it was NUM. NUM was the union which really bought into the idea that you could sit around the table, that you could negotiate with the bosses, that you could do the productivity deals, that you could do the wage restraint, that you could be in Nedlac, etc., etc. And its members deserted the union. And they revolted, and they've gone somewhere else. And actually, I, I think the implication of, of the social contract the, or, or the social pact that you're talking about is precisely about telling unions to discipline their members and to have realistic expectations and to be the pig, <laughs> not the chicken, with all, with all of that implies. And actually, the, the, the result, I think, of 2008 was maybe an unsettling of business at some level, but a much greater unsettling of labour. <coughs> 
because where the Unzamandi Zuma access has tried to cool the shots within the unions, within Kasatu, we can see the results of that now. Mass revolt outside of, part of it outside of the unions, Kasatu, Kasatu split down the middle, probabilities of all kinds of splits and so forth, and maybe there actually lies a possibility. Any last questions? Because this will be the last round. I see a hand raised right at the back there. I half see a hand right at the back there. Is that right? Or should we just impose a question? That's not one. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you. I'm Caesar from the ASC. Uh, the question I'd like to raise is uh, firstly, in terms of this ruling party and their own political impulses, which we trace as a economic policies, should it be that uh, we are in a capitalist democracy on which the nationalist government is on power to say we are pushing so, uh, socialism? Uh, for an example, if this NDP truly it is there to represent the needs of the people, we have the so-called freedom charter. I think that is a is a, is, a, is an amendment of the freedom. It's the same thing. There's no there's no difference. Uh, they indicated that the people should govern, but it seems like um, day by day the, the people who say who are, are entitled to govern the, the, the country are, are, are some kind of I don't know whether this country should we say it is led by the ANC or it's led by Western powers or the South even the East, because now it comes to this issue of the e -tolly. According to me, I think the e is psychologically unrealistic because if you say we have to pay using our own roads, it means that the, the, the previously oppressed people are still going to continue to be oppressed through policies on which I believe this is turning into a, an African imperialism because if now we have to pay, there's very same people who are trying to recover the, the, the victimization called, caused by, by colonialism I have to pay to use these roads in any form, in any part. I think it, it tends to say the government in itself, or the, should I say, I may include the state in itself because uh, there is no pol economic policy that I think is, is up and running in, the, in, in our country because we don't know whether we are in a capitalist society or in a communist society. Yes, we are free. I agree. Uh, there are equality policies, pol policies, I agree. But the government in itself doesn't have a system which economically accommodates all the masses. So what do you say in such a state? You say, are we not turning this whole thing into African imperialism? Or we are pushing the agenda of saying, uh, the people should govern through socialism. Thank you. Um, and now there's, okay, another hand over here. Uh, this is a rolling, a rolling match. Thanks, Kai. Yeah. I think you, if there's anyone who, you've been one of the authors of the NDP. Myself? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the name is Buyo, because you said name, I work for the World Federation of Trade Unions and, and norms are the matter of workers. And I must say that I mean, the presentation and, uh, by, by Ellen has been very disappointing, wishful thinking, dreamy, and, 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 and not based on the actual material relatives that, that, that are obtaining in South Africa. I must say that. You said that um, the NDP is a fundamental shift from here. And I don't see any evidence that, that is presented. Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, I have a serious problem with that. Well, the NDP very clearly is a continuity to gear. No fundamental changes, no serious significant changes of any substance whatever. It's a continuation. It, it, it encourages inequality, as, as, as Jack has been, has been arguing. You know, it accepts inequality until 2030. There's no serious dent that it proposes. The NDP has been offered. Um, okay, God, by, by, by the World Bank. Hence the IMF, I mean, are endorsing it. Same, same processes, same content, same context as gear was in 1995-96. So I'm saying we've been living in South Africa as the working class. 
under many social pens, social, social contracts. You know, even Netflix itself has not been able to produce any meaningful um, what change or hope to the working class. So basically, I mean, uh, we, 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 we disagree with you. And I must say that currently we, we, we have seen the working class in South Africa being regarded as the most militant in the world by, by your World uh, Economic Forum report that came uh, two years ago. So, I mean, there are, there are prospects, there are possibilities. We, just, we must just continue to mobilize the working class. I think the working class also needs more resolute, decisive leadership, you know, and, and, and more organization, you know, and, and decisiveness. That's what we need in the country, not social pets. You are arguing, you know, advocating the status quo. I mean, capital, you know, uh, running and controlling everything. And the working class must accept that. Your peculiar your, your situation is as well as treated by, by Jane and as well as by Ben. By, by Thanks. Thanks, Will. Can I just say on the question of. Hold <laughs> <laughs> on, The NDP and the authorship of the NDP, that in two weeks' time I'm talking. <laughs> 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 what we hear you? <laughs> and you'll hear me. Um, I think you'll hear me. Hopefully not the World Bank. <laughs> um, I'm going to hand over to Adam. I mean, we've, we've, we've kind of run out of time, but I thought it's very important to, to get a range of voices from our, you know, from our audience, we, to have that sort of participation. So Adam, what I want to say to you is if you just cherry pick, you know, there's right. no need for you to comprehensively try and, and cover everything, but to choose the points that you want to make as a, as a kind of a wrap up and a postscript and perhaps the introduction to the next book. <laughs> what? Uh, colleagues, let me start off by saying that the book is quite critical of the NDP, by the way. It does not defend the NDP. It's particularly critical. It's actually more, uh, it's critical of two parts of the NDP. What is this chapter on the state? Because it says while it makes some useful proposals, that it doesn't go far enough. And actually, ironically, I said the other day, uh, I said earlier on, it uses Carl's work to critique the NDP and the state. Uh, and Carl's work particularly on Marijuana and, and the bureaucracy and how, uh, what, what the challenges are. The second part it's quite critical of is the, the economic chapter. And I said to you earlier on, it's very critical of the economic chapter that because it doesn't address inequality. And I think inequality is the big issue. <coughs> Having said that, that doesn't mean I think the FTP is exactly the same as GIA. It I acknowledge that it is a different document. But I don't think it goes far enough. And it does acknowledge in, that, in the book the kinds of critiques around the post-2008 project. And it says, post-2008, there are some social democratic elements that come into play, but there are also continuities with the old project, and the financialization is one of the issues. There's an interesting, in chapter 3 or 4, there's a reflection with Trevor Manuel in the book. Because I had written to, Trevor Manuel had written to me, uh, in, a, in, in an email saying, I carry on saying that South Africa had a conservative macroeconomic agenda. And what do you mean by that? What would you have done? And <laughs> in 2010, I then, I didn't uh, respond immediately. And then I said, okay, I will. And I wrote him a 15-point plan on what I wouldn't have done. And he responded. And I, in the book, I, I do this. I said, this is what he said. This is my response and this is my critique. And the critique is very similar to what you're suggesting about the financialization, allowing, uh, uh, about having allowed our big conglomerates to relocate. And I said, you don't have to be a communist to stop Anglo from relocating on the landed board. Actually, the Australians are not very, very far from being communists, prevented their own companies from moving. That even by kind of capitalist terms, social democratic terms, you acted even more conservative than you should have. So it does all of this critique. And it is, Jane, very critical of the issue of the economic chart. Having said that, my question, and I think this raises the issue that Patrick raises, the union movement has to recognize that even though you're critical, the big danger is what is the politics of the critique? And the biggest, one of the things that this book looks at is how we had the right policies, Merg, in 1993, 1994, and it says the failure of Merg was not policy, it was politics. And my argument is that the failure of the, of the critique of the NDP is politics, not policy. Because what you're doing is you're kind of positing in the public domain a kind of radical critique that doesn't look 
And what Gramsci knew, or what Ali spoke about, is structural reforms, the bridge between what exists now and what the potential future is. And it's about politics. You're alienating a whole series of social forces that any revolution needs to your assistance. And that's the point about this argument. That in, in effect, one of the big challenges, and I give various examples in chapter seven about where it is possible to construct a, 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 a deal. And a deal that will appeal to the broad middle classes and will be part of a social democratic platform. But that's not what the union movement is arguing. When you listen to Irvin Jim, I'm just using him as a name, by the way, that I think well, it gets projected as such an extreme critique that you lose the very social forces that could be your allies in the, pro in, in, in the, in the project of an alternative project. And the question is, how do you articulate your critique in a way? Now, I gave one example about the new wage subsidy, the youth wage subsidy. And I said this kind of crazy debate about the youth wage subsidy, about whether you replace employed workers with, with, with young workers. And I said, there's an easy way to deal with this. And I said this, by the way, in a Kosato workshop a couple of weeks ago. I said, what you need to do is say, anybody who, who qualifies for the youth wage subsidy, here's the numbers of uh, workers you have. While you're in receipt of the youth wage subsidy, you can't let workers go. That's the thing. You, you force employers to write to an employment contract. That's a radical move. They'll be, they'll be, they'll be, they will be crazy to do that, or they'll, they'll find it difficult. But you know what? It sounds rational. It, it appeals to a large amount. You will attract a much more positive debate. So for me, I said this, by the way, the other day to, to, to some of the big businesses. And I was speaking at the Reserve Bank, and I said this. You can, if you think the union movement's going to disappear, then you're really crazy. What you have to think about is coming to an agreement because they write their responsibilities to defend their members. But that union movement has also a responsibility for a broad developmental project. And it needs to articulate that project in terms that are structured and make sense to people in today's reality. Not in terms of such an extreme radical project that nobody can identify with except a narrow band within the trade union movement. That's the big challenge. And I want to come, and I think that's the real debate. It's about the politics, not about the policy. The big failure previously was we ignored the politics. We focused on policy, and this is not about policy, it's about understanding politics. And then finally, I wanted to say, you're right, Kirani. Uh, the real issue is that I'm looking at a, as a social democratic project. And you write that it occurred in a different historical epoch. And I argue that what made it happen was not simply the social context, but the fact that political elites became uncertain. And they cut the deal and economic elites became uncertain. But you write it was constructed in an era of bipolarity. And the, question, the book asks, how do you recreate that uncertainty of elites in a different historical moment? And it asks that you have to focus on the domestic which is why it looks at mobilization, which is why it looks at the issues of, of opposition parties, which is why it looks at those kind of variables to create the uncertainty. The logic of a social democratic project is political and economic elites become uncertain. And the question is, in this moment, how does that happen? Because if you don't do that, there is no midwife to the, to the, to the social democratic project that comes to it. And that's where I want to, to actually bring it to an end. Uh, I will say, and I think that there is one thing that is worth, worth, worth ending off with, is the social pact. You know, this is the irony I was laughing. If, you are, this, if this debate took place 10 years ago, I was on the opposite side. And I, I see a number of faces here that were arguing for the pact, and I was arguing against the pact. And somebody said to me, you've changed your line. I said, no, context has changed. <laughs> context has changed. Your strategy is determined in relation to your context. And I think it was Eddie who said that you changed your line. And I think that's the big thing. And I think that's what we confront. If you really believe we're in the cusp of 1905, then you're right. The social bad pact doesn't make sense. But I don't believe that. 
I don't believe we're in a pre-revolutionary moment. In fact, I don't believe the trade union movement is strong enough to withstand its own forces because I'm telling you, not only is capital going to act against the union movement, significant strands of the ANC itself will act against, the, against this thing. And so the answer is to understand if it's not in a pre-revolutionary moment, what else is there? And in that context, I'd say, cut the deal for social democracy because it